Do you believe that a higher form of non-human intelligence has visited this planet? Non-human intelligence exists. Non-human intelligence has been interacting with humanity. This interaction is not new, and it's been ongoing. And there are unelected people in the government that are aware of that. We have to ask ourselves the big questions about our existence and what the presence of other life out there in the universe means for us. So your openness is the most important thing that I'm here asking you for. I know we're going to figure this out and I know it's going to be weird, but it's definitely going to be okay. Aliens are probably real. I think it's safe to say that now with the number of government witnesses that are coming out and all the stuff that's happening in Congress, as well as what's due to happen in the next six months to a year. I want to get you all up to speed on what's been happening in Congress, what's due to happen, and what's happening outside of Congress too, all leading up to answering the big question, are we alone in the universe? And then we're going to talk about why this is important and why as a life coach, I feel it's important for people in my industry to be talking to you about this. Let's dive in. So what do we know about this topic so far? For a lot of people, including myself, it kind of started in 2017. That New York Times article came out talking about the fact that we had this program called ATIP, A-A-T-I-P-A. And it was led up by this guy named Lou Elizondo. He left his post. Uh, the government was hesitant to even admit that he existed and he ran this program, but they ultimately did confirm it after some pressure. But the New York Times, very reputable journalist, came out talking about this program, basically saying, look, the government lied. They, they've been telling us that they haven't been looking at this, but they have been looking into this very much so, and a lot more recently than we thought. Our government also has basically confirmed through a number of hearings that uap or ufos they do exist and by the way uap means unidentified anomalous phenomena the term results because we not only see these objects in space in our atmosphere in the regular sky and then also in water military pilots and many other people have witnessed these objects go into water just the same way as they kind of fly through the air and through space. It seems as though they do it without resistance and without losing momentum because of the drag and the pressure of water. It's a little perplexing. We don't know what they are and they don't belong to our adversaries or us. That leaves open the window, of course, who do they belong to? And I think the kind of uncomfortable yet obvious conclusion is someone or something else. David Grush came forward a very highly ranked security intelligence official who was part of the UAP task force, among other similar roles. His basic allegations were one, that we've known about UFOs or UAP for a very long time, that our government has had a crash retrieval and reverse engineering program for at least 80 years, that non-human intelligence does exist, and we have retrieved not only the craft, but also biological materials, bodies, from these landings, from these crashes. And one of the other main allegations was not only is he aware that people have been personally threatened and perhaps unalived for trying to reveal knowledge or in an effort to keep this secret. And not only did other people receive threats, but also that David Grush himself received threats. It's David Grush's testimony. The Pentagon came forward with a report from the RO office, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, head up most recently by Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, who was the head of that department. The report essentially said that we've investigated ourselves and we find no evidence of any of those things that David Grush was talking about. Sean Kirkpatrick, the gentleman head up RO that did this report, he alleged that the allegations that David Grush made were not included that he did not have access to them, and that David Grush essentially blew him off for interviews. It turns out that might actually be somewhat true, though I think there is a pretty explainable reason for it. As a result of a recent release of a FOIA request, text messages between Christopher Mellon, who was the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, text messages between him and Sean Kirkpatrick were talking about David Grush coming to do an interview. Sean Kirkpatrick is alleging that he's blown him off and that if he's getting the advice from his attorney to 
not interview, then that would be bad advice. Well, first of all, David Grush's attorney is actually the original inspector general. Very, very, very talented lawyer and somebody who I think is probably in the position to know whether or not it would be a good idea for David Grush to interview with these folks. I don't want to bore everyone with the text messages, but in pertinent part, the text messages discuss and emails from David Grush discuss some of the reasons why he did not take that interview. The first was that Sean Kirkpatrick alleged that all of the information that David Grush provided to the Inspector General for intelligence was not accessible by his office. As far as I can tell, that is actually untrue and that information could have been accessed. Second, I believe David Grush's attorney was advising him not to take this meeting, and I believe the reason was something that he alluded to during his testimony and that has come to fruition since, which is as a result of his testimony and the witness statements provided to the Inspector General, there was a criminal investigation opened that David Grush couldn't talk much about, and it had to do with being threatened by officials and threats against others by officials in an effort to keep the secrets that he's trying to bring forward. It is unclear who could be a target of that investigation. However, it has been speculated by those who understand this issue well and follow it closely that someone in the RO office, in Sean Kirkpatrick's office, very much could be a target of that investigation. And it would not be good for David Grush to have a meeting with people who some of them may be targets. The other concern that David Grush personally had was that he was unclear as to whether it would be appropriate for him to share all of the things that he shared with the Inspector General with Aro. Particularly the concern was that Aro itself or some of the members who would be investigating this on behalf of Aro did not have the proper clearance, perhaps, to hear some of this information. So I guess there's a little more to be revealed there. But long story short, I believe this information was a little bit used to discredit David Grutch, but I think there's a pretty rational explanation for why that meeting didn't happen and potentially why that report came out the way it did. It's a little confusing for people who don't follow this issue very closely to understand that What's happening right now is that there's a lot of confusion about whether or not these things exist within the government itself, even if the general public is now willing to accept this in large part. It seems as though there very much is a gatekeeping happening within the government that is resulting in people in different sectors of government or in different programs within one sector of government getting different information about this. So I wanna share a text message with you that I think might help explain some of this. So let's take a look at this message. Again, this message is from Christopher Mellon. He is the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence. He's speaking in this message to a senior government official who is not named, but I suspect either has or will be one of the people who give some sort of witness statement at least to the Inspector General for the intelligence community on this topic. This text message is apparently from around 2020. This is from the US government official, blank, a name, and I are making huge progress getting into the CR program, crash retrieval program. He plans to meet with you at some point. The blank would be slack jawed if they found out what we now know. Christopher Mellon responds, and uh, most of this is redacted, so I'm gonna do my best based on the response. He says something that is redacted and it ends with an abbreviation for the year 1945, I'm presuming. I think he's asking something along the lines of, do the programs go back to 1945? The senior US government official responds, right now we haven't gone that far back. We're dealing with the recovered UAP that landed in Kingman, Arizona in the 50s. Notice the term landed versus crashed. I don't know if that's significant or not. We're vacuuming up info as blank blank, presumably a name, gets read in. We now know the management structure and security control systems and ownership of the crash retrieval. We also know who recovers landed or crashed UAPs and under what authorities. We also know that a still highly classified memo by a secretary of the U.S. Air Force in the 1950s is still in effect to maintain the cover on UAPs. He continues, we also know the SES-2, who's the Air Force gatekeeper. Uh, that name has been redacted, but it was provided to Congress. And the SES-2, I think, is a ranking. So really interesting stuff. It's really a big deal for someone of Chris Mellon's caliber. Him leaking that himself 
is a pretty large statement. When it's talking about the ownership of crash retrieval, that has to do with something that David Grush said in a previous interview with David Grush, just before his congressional testimony, he spoke about basically that defense contractors and some Fortune 500 companies are actually the people who physically possess a lot of these recovered materials. And I think he was alluding to the fact that perhaps it was designed that way so that if anyone ever found out the government was hiding this stuff, they could say, oh, but we don't own it. That might actually come to backfire because depending on the level of ownership that outside corporations may have over this material, they may not be very willing to share it. And frankly, I can understand the argument as to why that that is legitimate stance to take. So it further complicates things quite a bit. I just have to take a moment to reiterate how big of a deal it is that people like David Grush, people like Chris Mellon, uh, some other people that are coming forward, and some video that I'm going to show you in a minute, that um, the caliber and the level of intelligence that some of these folks worked in, when I say it is like career suicide to talk about things like this, if it turns out to be BS, I mean, like, it is seriously career suicide to bring it up in general. I mean, some of these people are really risking their careers with no benefit. There's not really a giant benefit that could come to somebody. And not only that, David Grush in particular, he subjects himself to criminal liability if uh, if what he says turns out to be false. And people who work this high up in intelligence, what the general public does not understand about roles like this is that, yeah, sure, these people do, they put in a lot of time for the US government, and they climb the clearance and security intelligence ladder. And with that comes higher and higher clearances. David Grush, for example, he has the same clearance as basically the president does. The types of things that, that you're able to be privy to, that information level goes up exponentially as you get higher up in some of these levels. People that think that is just impossible, that our government could have kept the secret for as long as at least the 50s, maybe even back further. A lot of the reason that folks kept this secret was number one they may have literally been threatened with their lives it sounds like um number two people who work high up in security and intelligence and military careers like this they tend to retire a little early from their official government posts and go straight into working for your major defense contractors a lot of the times private corporations you know raytheon Boeing, uh, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, a lot of these places, you make exponentially more outside of government in these private roles. Once you quit your job for the government, you have to have your security clearances intact to be able to be offered those roles. David Grush, he testified to Congress about, you know, what he calls kind of administrative terrorism that, you know, they will threaten you with your clearance not to say anything about XYZ or else, you know, you will be stripped of everything and kicked to the curb, which is like, it's the highest dishonor for these people. A lot of these people have served their country. They have literally clawed and scraped their way to the top of the intelligence food chain. And for them to make a fool of themselves by spreading misinformation or, or you know, alleging something that is just absurd, um, the stakes are just, I can't even really reiterate to you how, how high the stakes are. But the other thing that's important to talk about is, is why. Why did we have this? If this is all true, then why did we have this level of secrecy going from the very beginning? And I think a lot of that has to do with if the timeline matches up right, if, it, if this really came about either around the end of World War II or shortly thereafter, it was a scary time for us. Once you look into this topic as much as myself and many others, I think you come to a difficult understanding, an uncomfortable understanding that, okay, the reason that these programs were created and then kept very secret from all of us is for a number of reasons, many of them totally valid. Um, but it was very much in our interest not to let anybody know that we were working on such things because we don't want to tip a potential adversary off to something that may not, they may not even know about yet. So I can understand. And the other thing I think that might have contributed to secrecy is, is frankly, greed. The thought of being able to keep very advanced technology secret for as long as possible to get as much out of it as we possibly could without having to reveal much of what we know. 
that has a value to a lot of people. And let's not forget that this technology, I think by reasonable observation, definitely poses a threat to all of the systems of power and many industries in energy and defense all have interests that they want to protect there. Revealing this information, well, it could certainly upend those systems and do away with the way we've been doing things for quite a long time now. And frankly, when you involve corporations and money, people can get greedy and things tend to stay secret a lot longer that way. I think an average reasonable person can understand why at the inception of these programs that they were kept secret. But I think we're just at a point now in society where times have really changed a lot. People are much more willing and open to accept this. And frankly, I think there's just a large portion of people that they can't be fooled on this anymore. Like too much toothpaste has come out of the tube. You know, we can't really just put it back in and screw on the cap and pretend like none of these people ever said this and move on. Like we've, we've come too far for that. So that's kind of where we're at now. Now, what do we do about it? But those secrets are going to have to come out. Of course, in true universal fashion, this little gem popped up right as I was recording this very video. And so, Carl, here's, here's the million-dollar question. Do you believe that a higher form of non-human intelligence has visited this planet? Right. So non-human intelligence exists. Non-human intelligence has been interacting with humanity. This interaction is not new, and it's been ongoing. And there are unelected people in the government that are aware of that. How confident are you that that is true? There's zero doubt. And, and Carl, what evidence have you seen? What was the moment where you developed this level of conviction? Because what you're saying is extremely consequential and very important. And I know that a lot of people here, even perhaps, may not believe that statement. Right. Well, probably a better way to ask that is how can the folks in the audience come to the you know, a uh, common understanding of what this phenomenon is. And so there's sort of two tracks here. One is from first principles, and another is actually from the data. So, so let's take a look at the data. So we can look at some folks that have uh, very high level uh, access to information, like uh, Paul Hellyer, who was the defense chief for Canada, has come out and said the same thing. We can look at Ham Eshed, uh, the head of Israel's, or former head of Israel's Space Force, has said the same thing. Chris Mellon, Assistant, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Intel, SAPCO, has essentially said the same thing. Lou Elizondo has said the same thing. David Grush has said the same thing. David Grush cleared for presidentially level material. So you're looking at people that are in a position to know this, and they're telling you the same thing. You could take a look at the Gang of Eight in the Senate and in Congress. So there's two members of the Gang of Eight, Marco Rubio and Senator Chuck Schumer, that signed up to the UAP disclosure amendment last year that basically said they're not being told the truth and we need to push forward on that. So that's sort of a, an overview of some of the, the data. From a first principles standpoint, what's so unusual about this um, realization? There's billions of stars in the galaxy. Life here evolved in 500 million years, which is basically a blink of an eye. We've found planets around every star that we've looked at. It's likely that the universe is full of life. He kind of said it all, didn't he? That is Carl Nell. His list of accolades goes on so long I had to write us all down. He was in Army Space Command. He worked for Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. They actually had him go get a degree in mechanical engineering. He worked on strategic studies, computer science. He went on to work for Bell Labs. He worked for Lockheed Missiles and Space. Northrop Grumman ran strategic tech program. A lot of R&D, military department, sorry, deputy chief of staff, from Combatant Command, Army Futures Command, and his last post was for the UAP Task Force. Interesting history of different types of programs and strategies. Certainly someone who would be in the know. So I guess for now, we're stuck with the roller coaster ride of seeing how this shakes out in our government. As always, with the government, sometimes 
information and help does not come in the pace in which we could really use it, but that's a process that's going to have to work itself out. There is something you can do to help move things along. While there is a lot of bipartisan support for this, in the House Oversight Committee, you have people like AOC and Jamie Raskin in full agreement with the likes of Congressman Burchett and Anna Paulina Luna and Matt Gates. So all of these people coming together on the same topic says something to me, and it should say something to you. The UAP amendments that were signed into the Defense Authorization Act, but only in part, they're actually thinking of revoting on that. If you could write your senators, your congressmen, I think it actually would be impactful. The members already working on this are working hard, but if you can help them convince their friends and colleagues that they need to be in on it too, I think it would actually do a big service in moving the needle on this. Because make no mistake, this absolutely impacts your life. By all accounts, it does seem very much like something that is real and is happening. And I don't think that we're going to go backwards in thought on this. But we can't just depend on our government. We all need to be doing more. Subject matter experts in relevant fields, science, space, engineering, anthropology, leading experts are actually becoming very invested in this topic and they want to find out how they can help. Well, some of these materials may not be open source for all of us to study and may be very safely guarded by our governments. It doesn't mean that these people can't research on their own. And that's why there is a foundation called the Soul Foundation. Soul Foundation is head up by Professor Gary Nolan. He's a professor of pathology at Stanford very well respected. There is an advisory board of top minds in anthropology, sciences, sociology, intelligence, politics, medicine, the list goes on. They're asking the big questions and they're trying to work around the limitations of government. The basic premise is to put the brightest minds into this and figure out what a post-disclosure world looks like. How do we get to that point where the general public accepts this and understands it and isn't frightened by it and we have a controlled process where people can kind of come to grips with this uh, in a way that is digestible. And the basis for this is going to be through research, through public releases, through political education and activism. The Soul Foundation gave a conference actually back in November and I've been sitting on this waiting for the right time to wrap a lot of this information together and present it. A very interesting leak came out of this conference. It is a timeline for disclosure. And who presented the timeline, you might ask? Well, the gentleman in the video that I just showed you, Carl Nell, who most recently worked for the UAP task force. So here's this document. It's basically a timeline showing theoretical phases that could be used to help disclose the presence of non-human intelligence to the general public. It talks about different sectors through policies, through law, national security motives, philosophical investigation, humanities, ethics, anthropology, sociology, religion, scientific research, the natural sciences, physics, chemistry, material science, biology, and private sector, industry and society, intellectual property, industry, economics, trade. Now, first phase is demonstrating existence. Like these things exist, working towards getting the government to accept. Hypothesis generation, objective, government acceptance. So we're in phase one right now. We're trying to get the government to just accept this. And I think we're pretty close to that. People in the highest forms of government are accepting of it, even if the departments and the sectors that they work for don't necessarily officially recognize it. In small factions and small groups, people are in the know. They're saying, okay, like, this is real. This is happening and we have to do something. We have to move forward with this. We've got to find a way to reconcile this with the public because we can't keep it in there forever. Phase two, correlate signatures. And the goal is for academic acceptance. So these experts furthering the interests of their field as it pertains to this topic and getting their peers to accept it. That's really what that's about. By the way, there are dates for these. Phase one says 1st of January, 2024. Phase two is January, 2026 would be a goal to get there by then. 
phase three, characterized performance. That is much more proactive in nature. It's a little more predictive. And the public has now kind of accepted it at this phase. The deadline for this is October 1st, 2030. Four. Ten years from now would be the deadline. First of October 2034. Determine nature. And then we're in post-disclosure world at that point. We've answered a lot of questions. And then phase five is engagement. And that's going to be a lot more interactive with society. That's going to be scientific discoveries. That's going to be strategic end state. Like, what do we do? How do we interact with the other folks out there in the universe, if you will? So interesting numbers here and interesting dates. The ultimate goals of all of this are to restore proper oversight, avoid a catastrophic disclosure. Carl Null talked a lot about that in the interview I just showed a little bit of. It's about a 20 minute interview and I'm going to link it in the description. I think it is worth a view. He talked about wanting to avoid the catastrophic disclosure situation. We don't want to have a lot of people freak out. We don't want to have whole entire global systems crash. If everything came out all at once and people didn't really have the time or the space to really digest it and slowly come to terms with new pieces of information. That's a lot of information to give people who don't know anything about this. That would be a very difficult way for folks who are rather resistant to information like this or just don't know who might be sensitive to it. It's just not a good plan to just dump things on people, especially, you know, some of the biggest questions humans could kind of ask themselves, like, are we alone in the universe? Like just dumping the answer on people in a very abrupt or a very jarring way probably will not go well, but not just personally, like our world economic systems could collapse. There are a lot of bad things that could happen if we went about this the wrong way. Also, part of the goal is to have proper government oversight. Look, look, we have people running programs that we don't even know what they're doing out there or who they're interacting with. This sounds trippy and it sounds wild, but David Grush and other people similarly situated have alluded to the fact that there are people in our government that have come to agreements with other intelligence. So there perhaps has been some communication there and some cooperation of some sort. And I know that sounds like a lot, but that's where we need to help people understand in a way that is going to be productive for all of us. This has been interesting to look into, but as a life coach, I feel as though I would be remiss if I didn't talk to you about this. I don't think I could reiterate, and I don't think I can even fully comprehend with my human brain, just how much this revelation is going to affect us. And again, not going towards fear, I don't think that fear or avoidance will help us at all when it comes to this. So whether we do it now on our own accord or whether we wait for the shoe to drop, it's really important that we ask ourselves some of the big questions. Technology. This is technology that is very much going to change almost every aspect of our life. And that could be a whole video on its own, as well as many other topics related to this, frankly. We have to ask ourselves the big questions about our existence and what the presence of other life out there in the universe means for us. Does it affect our major religions and all of that? I think the answer is yes. I think that we actually might in this lifetime find out some of the answers of our creation by learning more about the universe in this way. And I'm going to do a video about religion and the possibility of life elsewhere because actually when we look to hypnotherapy and regressive hypnotherapy, there actually might be some answers there. And um, I've read some really interesting things that actually I think might help people feel better about this, not worse. However we do it, we have to get to a point where we just accept this and we understand that it just is what it is. And certainly that's going to require us to think about things differently and to change. So your openness is the most important thing that I'm here asking you for. Openness to the idea that life exists elsewhere. Openness to the idea that some of our most strongly held societal beliefs might not be necessarily true. It doesn't mean that you can't believe in a creator being. It doesn't mean that everything in the Bible or whatever religious text that you've ever been raised with is wrong. There are a lot of things that it might mean and not mean, but 
openness is the greatest key to success in not having a negative reaction and being able to change your mind when confronted with new information. It's all part of being a rational, healthy, balanced human being. And while this particular issue is due to create some imbalance, we can certainly balance ourselves out and we will be able to do that if we can remain open-minded and curious. Fear is the other thing we need to confront. I think it would be irresponsible for me to suggest that there isn't a darkness to any of this new information that's gonna come out. I think we're gonna find out that we might have a lot of potential friends out there in the universe, but I think there's also a chance that we're gonna find out there are some more self-serving and potentially less positive beings out there and whatever whatever the presence is. But that being said, no one but other human beings and our governments are showing up, knocking on our door and doing any harm to us ever. Whatever, whatever kind of less positive influence or presence that may be out there, that presence is not very present in your daily life now. And we've been living all these years without walking around with that fear. So it doesn't mean that you need to have a new fear. You know what I'm saying? Don't get ahead of yourself and don't be swindled into kind of thinking that there is only something bad and, you know, Mars attacks is going to be your reality next week. <laughs> That's definitely not going to be the case and we're going to be fine. But post-disclosure, once we get over that and we're just living life and we recognize that this just is what it is and we're in the new world, whatever that looks like and whenever that exactly kind of unfolds, I think we can do this by 2030. I have a lot of hope for us because I guess my kryptonite is that I'm endlessly optimistic, but we have to work at it all as individuals. Um, if you're hearing this and all of this stuff I've been talking to you about is news to you, write about it in your journal. Talk about it with your family. I feel like it's an important thing for you to think about and I feel like they're important conversations for you to have with those around you. I know we're going to figure this out. And I know it's going to be weird. But it's definitely going to be okay. We are definitely going to be okay. I can certainly promise that it will never be boring from here on out. I encourage you to approach the topic with interest and intellect rather than fear and avoidance. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, this topic has a ton of information attached to it. And from many different angles as well. So we're just really scratching the surface and I'm gonna continue digging and continue showing you guys what I think is credible and real and pertinent to your life and all of our futures. I'm a life coach. I help people with various aspects of their lives and this isn't one that is affecting us today and now, but it's gonna affect us very, very much in the near future. And it's something that we all need to be thinking about. So please like, comment, subscribe. It really helps to grow the channel and get this message out there. And of course, if you're more interested in life coaching content and all that, please check out my other social medias and my website. So stay curious. Until next time, see you at the next level. Mm -hmm.